let's zoom out for a moment and and just sort of address prebiotics, probiotics, and postbiotics. Yeah, it's something I wanted to talk about. Okay, perfect. Yeah. So, um, so everyone has heard of probiotics. By definition, probiotics are living microorganisms that provide benefits to human health. All right. Um, but now you probably are starting to see in your supermarket the word prebiotic. This is starting to show up. What is that? Well, that is food for our gut bacteria. Mm-hmm. So in other words, this is, this is basically something that it, um, powers the probiotic bacteria, and then we get a benefit as a result of that. Postbiotics is the third, and postbiotics is, is what they produce. That's actually what really matters, is the postbiotic. So, but in order to get there, you have to basically combine prebiotics and probiotics. You have to put them together. So when we put them together, then like, for example, you take fiber and you combine it with healthy gut bacteria. And what gets produced by that are the short chain fatty acids, butyrate, acetate, and propionate. Fiber by itself would just run through you. It would do nothing. Microbes without fiber, they can't produce something from nothing. But when you combine the two fiber plus the gut microbes, you get this beautiful thing that can power your health. All right, so I tend to favor the prebiotics. It's not to say that there's no value for probiotics. We can dig into that more if you want to. I'm happy to do that. There's definitely value to probiotics. But I tend to favor as a first line approach, the prebiotics. The reason why is because what I'm saying is that if you have the probiotics, but you don't have the fiber, you can't make anything. What's missing is the fiber. So if we bring the fiber, we can actually grow the probiotics. So the ingredients that exist within 38 Terra, our daily microbiome nutrition, have human clinical studies to show that they increase bifidobacteria, acromantia, and fecal bacterium. And these are three probiotic forms of bacteria that you actually grow as a result of taking the product, right? So I guess the point from my perspective, Nick, is that I like to start with the concept of feeding them with the prebiotics. In terms of the probiotics, it's a targeted approach. So it kind of depends on what you're trying to accomplish. There is a role there, but like my supplementation protocol starts with prebiotics. Yeah, I'm really curious. I'd actually like to talk about probiotics for a little bit. Yeah. I have never personally had success with probiotics. Yeah. Where, you know, I purchase an over-the-counter, high-quality probiotic supplement it has large quantities of, of CFUs and multiple different strains of probiotics, nothing targeted specifically based off of testing on myself and then identifying what I need. And it almost always destroys my gut. Yeah. Why is that? And what's the problem with this mass blast probiotic approach? <laughs> All right. So, First of all, the reason why it's probably destroying your gut is it's too many CFUs. So you're opting for a more is better approach, um, but it's probably overwhelming your innate microbiome. And the result of that is like everything's upset as a result of that. Um, So we have to zoom out and and sort of like, let let me present the way that I would approach this if I were you, okay? So you have a unique microbiome that is distinctly yours. There's no one on the planet with the same microbiome as you. I can't tell you whether a probiotic is gonna be good for you or be net neutral, meaning it does literally nothing, or actually be harmful and cause trouble for you. I can't tell you that until you try. There's not a test that exists, including a microbiome test, that will answer that question. What answers the question is trial and error. You try it, you see what happens. But before you try, We want to be smart about what we choose to actually put in there. And it should be, I I mentioned earlier, it's targeted. So the concept that exists out there of, hey, there's this one probiotic that's going to fix your metabolism, your immune system. It's going to make you feel full. It's going to fix your digestion. Like that one probiotic, because it's got 20 strains, it's going to do all those things. That's that's complete hogwash. Mm Mm-hmm. So, by the way, I was looking forward to saying hogwash while we're here in Texas. Like, <laughs> um, so, that's complete nonsense. Instead, the approach should look like this. Um, I have gas and bloating. I'm looking for a solution that's going to address my gas and bloating. 
what is the probiotic that has a human clinical trial to prove to me that in general, this is helpful for that particular goal. That's the one that you want. You want to use it in the amount that was proven in the study. But then it still comes to the trial and error where, okay, yes, we have a human clinical study. It says that it works. Now I'm going to try it. And when you try it, you do it for anywhere from 30 to 60 days. But if you're not getting the benefit that you're looking for, it's time to move on. Right. Right. Even if it's proven by a study, it doesn't mean that it's proven for you. What's proven for you is what actually works. So that's the key from my perspective. So it really starts with, though, asking the question, like, what am I hoping to accomplish here? And based upon that goal, going out and finding the thing that's actually proven in a human clinical study to work. But I'm assuming the issue could be that you find the one strain that is identified for your problem, but that product has seven other strains of bacteria in there that could be disrupting another part of your gut. So you're not actually experiencing the benefit because it's being covered up by an intolerance to another strain. It could be that you have an intolerance to another strain. It could be that, look, your your personal gut microbiome, this just doesn't work. It's not, you know, it's not that the product is worthless. That product, that same product will may work for someone else, right. but it's just not gonna work for you. And you know, it kind of gets back to this broader question of like the individualism that we have within our gut microbiome. You know, why is it that I can take a medication? that would work for nine out of 10 people, but yet there's this one person out there that's gonna give them a horrible adverse effect, right? And I can't predict that. And if I could, clearly I would not have given it to them in the first place. Yeah. So why is it that the exact same thing could be so helpful to so many people and yet potentially cause serious harm for someone else? I think the answer to that question exists within the microbiome. Is there anything more unique in our body other than the gut? that requires so much specificity? Um, so there's nothing so unique as that in terms of in terms of being highly individualized. So, you know, put it this way. Um, if you had an identical twin, they have the same genetic code as you, same parents. Um, they, in, in the vast majority of cases, grew up in the same house, eating the same type of food, many times same similar activities, right? So yet you would only share 30% of the same microbes. You would be 70% different with your identical twin. And then it's way less when you're talking about a brother or sister. And then it's even less than that when you're talking about someone that you don't even know. Mm. Where you and I sitting across from one another, I mean, look, I think that there's actually quite a, a, a significant amount of similarity in terms of dietary choices that we make, regardless of whether I eat meat or don't eat meat. I think there's a lot of similarity that exists there. But yet, despite that, our microbiome may only be 10% the same, right? Whereas our human genetic code is going to be more than 99% the same. This is a, a one-off question, but I'm just curious. Um, talking about the differences in, in one another's gut microbiome, do you have any data or, or research or findings from what happened to people's guts and... Um, bacteria in in their their stomach their gut during the pandemic it's a great question um i i haven't seen any significant data so we have to sort of reverse engineer it which is to say if we go through and think about some of the things that were happening during the pandemic mm -hmm. where like forced isolation right um uh let alone masking right and like intentionally disconnecting us from other humans there's no aspect of that that like over sanitizing over sanitizing exactly mm. there's no aspect of any of those things that is good for your gut there's no aspect of that right like the those choices that were being made and and, and forced upon us um are you know the argument that was made was for protection right you don't want to get exposed to this virus yet i think as we sit here today I think that like many of us have reconsidered what that looks like and whether or not those choices were appropriate, right. particularly for like kids. Yeah. Yeah. Cause I just think about like the, the lack of diversity you're getting from interacting with other people yep. or being outside or just the health of, of socializing and over sanitizing and over cleaning everything. And just the reduction of 
exposure to these different bacteria yep. that ultimately end up in our gut, you have to assume that it have negative consequences uh, from isolation. A hundred percent. In the same in the same way that people who isolate themselves and avoid illness actually become more vulnerable to health related issues right where their immune system can become confused and then you start to see the emergence of allergic diseases or autoimmune diseases where they think that they're actually improving their health yet actually in a way it's healthy for your immune system to be forced to step up and fight once in a while 